Morality plus willpower that doesn't work and consent plus desire which doesn't work. Here's my vision of what Christian sexual formation looks like. It's about a vision plus the power of the Holy Spirit plus godly practices that result in our restoration into the image of God. We get this vision of what sex is and what it's designed to do. We rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, which, who is within us, producing the fruit of the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, walking with the Spirit, not grieving the Spirit, acknowledging that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and then we begin to pattern our bodies in ways that delight, not grieve Him, and practices that become boundaries where our love is channeled towards restoration. That's why in Romans 7, 6, it says we serve in the new way of the spirit, not the old way of the written code. So this vision plus power plus practices brings about our restoration to the image of God. Now, this has to happen on two levels. Number one, it happens in individual spiritual formation. You personally have to choose and understand what has formed you sexually and then you have to submit yourself with a new vision and new power and new practices to how you will be reformed sexually. But I've got to be honest with you. This isn't easy. Every choice we make about sex involves a kind of suffering. Because at some point you have to renounce desires. This is a part of taking up your cross. But this has the possibility for deep transformation. Jean Fenet, who's a Catholic writer, says this, a commitment to purity is a sign of hope, an effort to bring personal order into a disordered world. Purity can be sought as a celibate single person or as a married person. Either state involves loneliness and sometimes anguish as well as hope. But blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, Jesus promised. Note the extent of the promise. Not that they will find complete sexual fulfillment and solve all loneliness, but that they will see God. So here's the chart that we see. I mean, individual formation, next, looks, looks like this. You've got fear and then you've got fascination. But on the other side, the next slide here, look at this. That's actually, I think, what it really looks like. <laughs> like, honestly, this is, this is messy. This is hard. But we are learning as people to create a counterculture, at least within our bodies, hearts, minds, where no matter how much there's craziness out there, we will have rightly ordered hearts and loves, that we are formed towards love towards God and love towards neighbor that promote their flourishing and not just personal satisfaction. We need this. But secondly, we need to be a church community of both discipline and delight. So we have to put boundaries up as a community. And I'll get into this more next week, talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's not our job to tell the world how to be the world, but it is our job to help the church be the church. And so we have to have an alternative culture of dating, a different vision of sexuality. We have to break generational cycles that flood themselves in and replace it with blessing and wholeness. We need to reclaim friendships. We need to widen the seats at our table. We need new celebrations and rituals where we support one another in our calling to follow Jesus faithfully in our crazy world. Carnal friendships are based on affinity or fun. Worldly friendships are based on usefulness, how we help each other, but spiritual friendships are designed to help us fulfill our call in following Jesus together. And we have to cultivate these rich friendships. Now, oh, all that, oh, by the way, this is good. I'm glad I didn't skip this. We need those boundaries of discipline, but the church should also be a plate, place of total joy and delight. Because it's actually joy, it's the joy of the Lord that's our strength, and it's joy that suppresses these base instincts. Listen, listen to this, this is literally fascinating. Neurobiologists have shown that while most brain development stops sometime in childhood, the brain's joy center, by the way, did you know you have a joy center in your head? The brain's joy center, located and observable in the right orbital prefrontal cortex, is the only part of the brain that never loses its capacity to grow. As Dr. James Friesen and his colleagues explained, when the joy center has been sufficiently developed, it regulates emotions, pain control, and immunity centers. It guides us to act like ourselves. It releases neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. And it's the only part of the brain that overrides the main drive centers. Food, 
sexual impulses, terror and rage. Without sufficient joy strength, we spend the rest of our lives trying to fill that deficit. So I want to, I've actually met with the leaders of our church and I've actually changed my title from lead pastor to joy center cultivator and overseer at Church of the City in New York. I want to have a church filled with joy. I honestly want people to step in and say, there is life here. I don't need what the world has because in his fullness, in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand, pleasure forevermore. This is better than a club. This is better than sin inside the community life because that joy represses ungodly sexuality, represses our fear. So the church would be a place of disciplined practices and delight and joy. And those things to me sound like a culture of life and a sexual culture of death.